Wow, for 2.30 in the afternoon, we've had more stay this year than we have over the, some of the past few years, and that's a great blessing for all of us because we get to be inspired again from Kay's message, and you have the added benefit of our bluegrass worship that we're going to enjoy here in just a few minutes. It's Grassy Valley is, is the name, uh, including the, the people that are in your bulletin. They are from Boone's Creek Christian Church, and we're very privileged that they are able to be with us uh, today. Some of them are uh, professional, self-employed by uh, uh, their careers, and we're very fortunate that they, uh, some of them have, uh, take Thursday off. So uh, they've left the whole business. They're making nothing to be here today, is what I'm trying to say. Just their love for the Lord and the chance to, uh, to lead us for worship. There you go. I hope you appreciate that very much. Um, we have something that is always very important to improving for next year, and uh, that's the evaluation forms. So when I come off the platform here, I'm going to uh, see if, if there'll be some who will help me distribute those. I already have one volunteer. Thank you very much. And maybe some others can help me let you dispense this, and uh, you'll find a pen or pencil if you don't have one in the back of the pew. And when you leave today, you can put it at the registration desk out front. That's, that's what they'd like you to do with these, please. All right, I've been asked only to make the very few other announcements. One of them uh, has everything to do with uh, Milligan College that has some very special programming going on uh, tomorrow and Sunday in their new Gregory Center, and it is over the course of their homecoming weekend with the Rock and the Rabbi and the Witness. Uh, there's been some material around about that, but if you're looking for something special to do for a ticketed event, please check both of those events out at Milligan College. And I'd been also asked uh, when Philip Eubanks, one of the workshop leaders, was here, to help uh, again remind you of next summer's uh, opportunity to be involved in the Senior Saints in the Smokies at Johnson Bible College and another new summer, summer enrichment program for adults, actually, that they are featuring. And, and brochures are available for both those events for next summer at Johnson Bible College out at, uh, at their display. Um, Gene Broccoli, are you, are you in here? Gene Broccoli? All right. Uh, he had asked me this morning when we started out to do something, and I think it was to thank Boone's Creek Christian Church for hosting. But he wanted to come up and do that because he thought it would be awkward for the associate minister to do that for you. But. So I'll ask the senior minister to thank Boone's Creek Christian Church. <laughs> Is Gene here? Wait a minute. It's done. Dick, on behalf of this illustrious group, we want to thank your wonderful church and your extremely gifted senior minister. Yes, that he is. Yes, yes. for hosting the yes. seniors rally this year. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And here's a token of our here's a token of our endearment. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. Gene, we've already thanked ourselves. Please come on up here. As, <laughs> as Gene is coming to the mic, uh, I want to say that Boone's Creek Christian Church just uh, serves uh, as the host this year, as, as we were asked to make facilities available. Gene and his wonderful committee are the people who make everything happen for you. Now, Gene, you go ahead with what you'd like to share. Glad we were get you no place. Uh, okay. Uh, I thought this would be uh, at the uh, end because I was going to thank Boone's Creek um, because they've had it on uh, uh, several occasions and they always do an excellent job. If there is a church that would volunteer to have it next year, please let some of us know that uh, somebody on the committee, in addition to uh, uh, myself, there's Thelma uh, Crumley and uh, Linda Broyles from here, Steve Trinkle from down around James, Jonesboro. Where's Jerry Williams? Jerry's from up in, in Virginia. If you would like to have uh, the rally, we already have the speaker engaged, and that's Bob Shannon. He's he, one of the pikers in our brotherhood. But uh, he's a, he just lives over in North Carolina, but he's agreed to be with us and be the speaker uh, next year. Have you mentioned Leonard? Okay. One who's on the committee who could not be with us today is Leonard Wymore. Leonard has been a part of this committee since its inception back uh, 
oh, sometime in the upper uh, 90s, is having surgery on Tuesday. He has been quite uh, sick. The surgery has been put off from time to time, trying to get his blood up to a level that he could undergo the surgery. And it's going to be Tuesday, and he has to be at the hospital, I think he said, at 5 o'clock in the morning. But you know, half it runs at a, at a hospital, it may be 2 in the afternoon before they get to him. But anyway, uh, he's having the surgery, and it's at the, uh, the uh, memorial uh, center here, the memorial hospital center. And anyway, uh, that, that, that may take care of it. Thanks again, Pla thank you, Buff City volunteer. Just, uh, just let us know. So we appreciate you, you coming and hope that you've taken a lot. Uh, we'll take a lot home with you. Uh, if you uh, st uh, looking for any more information, some of us probably still have some, some of the uh, outlines that we had in, uh, for our workshops. If you need something, just see some of uh, those who are in charge. And uh, you know something, uh, I used to say this to Bob Robinson, but I'm going to say it to, on David Clark. If they just had a pre good preacher here at Boone Creek, this church would be going great guns. <laughs> I'd like to just announce you all were here. That's the first time, first time this church been here since 18 what, Ed? 25. 1825, first time we've had a Baptist in the pulpit. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> David, David, introduce the guys. While I have David on the stage, I'm going to have him introduce Grassy Valley, and then we're going to let them start into our worship for the day. I'm going to uh, d distribute these throughout the congregation here, and remember to put them in the evaluations when uh, when you leave. Put them at the registration desk. David, tell us about who's going to perform. You, uh, anytime I get in front of a crowd and start to say names not written, I lose them, but I'm going to try. Lydia Horner, who is a junior, junior in high school, left school today to sing. Clancy Mullins who uh, builds, repairs banjos, retired and does that. Uh, he'll be playing the banjo. Jimmy Love, Dr. Jimmy Love, who's a pharmacist with Wilson Pharmacy, plays the guitar for this group. Ed Bowman, retired math teacher from Science Hill, uh, plays the bass. And Dr. Michael Wolf, uh, Gray Eye Healthcare Center, Sam Advertising too, plays the violin. Or oh, no, he plays the fiddle with the bluegrass man. And then Dr. Zach Pearson uh, from our church, but he's not able to be here today. But you'll enjoy them. They're all part of Boone's Creek Church, and uh, they feature Jimmy Love on the guitar. No, they don't. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no you'll enjoy this. You'll no, enjoy it. Thank you.
It's shouting time in heaven. A sinner once lost is found. It's shouting time in heaven. Salvation has been brought down. No wonder the angels rejoice to know my sins have been covered by the crimson flow, and now I'm feeling fine. I'm walking on a highway built by love. My name is written down in the courts above. It's shouting time in heaven. Oh, yes, it's shouting time. It's shouting time in heaven. Oh, yes, it's shouting time. Thank you for that, folks. We appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the seniors' gathering again this year. Thank you. We played this, uh, we played for you last year, and uh, two or three people asked us to come back. And I appreciate that. Um, this is the only regular gig we have. Is this the third year we've done this, Edward? Uh, we played this. We played the seniors rally three times, and that's a record for us. We play about once every blue moon or so. We're gonna sing one now. It's called "Where the Soul of Man Never Dies." <laughs> Keep the score, we're gonna stay in the key of D. In case you're playing along. You're welcome to sing along too. We sound better the more you sing, okay? So just keep that in mind. That's yours. <laughs>
day he wasted not his time away. He prayed to God, he prayed to God every morning, morning, noon and night. Care not for the things of Baal, but trusted one who never fails. Oh, Daniel prayed, oh, Daniel prayed every, morning, every morning, noon and night. Oh, Daniel served his Daniel living God while upon the this earth he trod. He prayed to God, he prayed to God every morning. Not for the king's decrees, trusted God to set him free. So Daniel prayed every morning, noon and night. They locked him in the lion's den because he would not honor men, but he prayed to God every morning. The jaws were locked, it made him shout, and God soon brought him safely out. Oh, Daniel prayed, oh, Daniel prayed every morning, morning, noon and night. Oh, Daniel served Daniel his living God, while upon this earth he trod. He prayed to God, he prayed to God every morning, noon and night. He cared not for cared the king's decrees, trusted God to set him free. free. So Daniel prayed. Oh, Daniel prayed Every morning, noon and night. Now, brother, let us watch and pray like Daniel did from day to day. He prayed to God, he prayed to God every morning, noon and night. Two can gladly dare and do and pray to God. He'll see us through. Oh, Daniel prayed. Oh, Daniel prayed. Every morning, noon and night. Oh, Daniel served his living God while upon this earth he trod. He prayed to God every morning, noon and night. He cared not for the king's decrees, trusted God to set him free. Oh, Daniel prayed every morning, noon and night. Oh, Daniel prayed. Oh, Daniel prayed every morning. And night. Folks, we appreciate that. I know David introduced the band. I'm going to tell you their names again. How about that? To my left, Dr. Michael Wolf. He runs the Gray Eye Health Center, uh, Gray Station Road in... Uh, Another plug, by the way, in gray. Michael's playing a fiddle that he made, which I think is pretty impressive. He's made several of those things. Um, standing behind me, Edward Bowman. Edward's a shepherd from over the hill here. Uh, lives on Grassy Valley Road. I think that's the reason we call ourselves Grassy Valley. We were formerly known as Clancy's Three Docks and a Shepherd Bluegrass Band, uh, which uh, cost too much to put on a T-shirt. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, we, we couldn't afford that many letters, so we, 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 uh, we changed our name. Uh, Edward's the shepherd in the band. He's playing a bass that was made by a little China woman uh, halfway around the world. He didn't make that bass, okay? <laughs> Over here to the right, Clancy Mullins is playing an instrument that he made, and he'll probably sell you after the show if you like. He's got his grandchildren on the back of it. Um, you can't beat that with a stick. Uh, Clancy uh, is kind of the backbone of this band and uh, teaches us all these songs. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Uh, he tries to teach us all these songs. We just don't take sometimes. Uh, we are pleased to be able to pick with him. My name is Jimmy Love, and I play guitar a little bit. I didn't make this either, uh, which you'll be happy to know. So a couple of folks up in Nazareth, Pennsylvania made, made this one. We feature uh, vocalist Lydia Horner. Lydia is a high school student uh, and uh, worships here with us, her and her family. Uh, and we're tickled to death that she agreed to sing with us. I know you've enjoyed her vocals so far. We've got a few more to play for you. And again, we appreciate you uh, uh, letting us be a part, of, um, a part of your gathering today. We're going to sing a song now. It's got a neat little title. It's called, uh, You Don't Have to Go Home, But You Can't Stay Here. I'm guilty of living my life 
like there's always tomorrow for making things right. But our days are numbered like the hairs on our head. And no man knows the hour he'll shake hands with death. Master timekeeper who died on the cross, and it breaks his heart knowing hell's gain is his law. But if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You'll know where you're going If he calls you tonight You'll have to go home Live up in glory But you Crying hole into the Lord, crying hole into the Lord. Lord, if I could, I surely would stand on that rock where Moses stood. Sinners run and hide your face. Sinners run and hide your face. Run to the rocks and hide your face, cause I hate Crying hole into the Lord, crying hole into the Lord. Lord, if I could, I surely would stand on that rock where Moses stood. Lord, I ain't no stranger now. Lord, I ain't no stranger now. I've been introduced to the Father and the Son. Lord, I ain't no stranger now. Crying hole into the Lord. Crying hole into my Lord. Lord, if I could, I surely would stand on that rock where Moses stood.
crying holy to my Lord, crying holy to my Lord. Lord, if I could, I surely would stand on that rock where Moses stood. But if I could, I surely would stand on that rock where Moses We're going to play a song. <laughs> we are. Had a memory lapse there. Had a little lapse in memory. We're trying to get on the same key, folks. myself in thee and I know some of them are now waiting over the dark and stormy sea I know that my troubles are all ended and happy and forever they shall be they are waiting and watching up yonder for that coming home of you and me for oh, that church in the valley little white church I love so well. I'm sad and I'm lonely. I'm sad and I'm lonely for that little white church in the town. Church in the valley, that little white church is the place I love so well. Now I'm sad and I'm lonely, I'm sad and I'm lonely for that little white church in the dell. <laughs> Good stuff. Folks, you don't know, but we've never played it like that. That may be the way to play it. We just never stumbled on it. That's good stuff. I got my part of it. We're going to go to the key of A. 
This song also features Lydia on vocals. It's, neat. it's got another neat title. This one's called Everybody Wants to Go to Heaven But Nobody Wants to Die. Neat little tune. too fast we can't fit all the words in <laughs> so we gotta play it slow everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die once upon a time there lived a man and his name was Hezekiah Walked with God both day and night, but he didn't want to die. He cried, oh Lord, please let me live, death is close, I know. God smiled down on Hezekiah, he gave him 15 years to go. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. to go to heaven but nobody wants to die when jesus lived here on this earth he knew his father's plan he knew that he must give his life to save the soul of man when judas had betrayed him his father heard him cry he was brave and still is dead but he didn't want to die everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die lord i want to go to heaven but i don't want to die well i long for the day when i'll have new birth because i love the living here on earth everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die to go to heaven but nobody wants to die lord i want to go to heaven but i don't want to die well i long for the day when i'll have new birth because i love the living here on earth everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die Folks, again, thank you for letting us be a part of today. We've got one more for you. Neat little tune you may be familiar with. In the bluegrass key of B's. <laughs> Four sharps, is that right? Five sharps. Five sharps. We don't care, we got a capo. That makes sense to a couple people out there. You know how many people it takes to tune banjo? Anybody? You can't tune a banjo. <laughs> Sounds like we're there.
heaven to stay. Stepping on the clouds, we'll see Jesus rise to meet him in the air. Stepping on the clouds, he will greet us. All the joy together we'll share. I'm gonna leave this world behind me, going where the devil cannot find me. I'm going higher, higher, higher. Ladies and gentlemen, Grassy Valley hip hop music for the hip replacement generation. <laughs> Brought to you by Gray Eye Healthcare. Can't see trouble when you blink? Come by and give us a wink. Gray Eye Healthcare, Dr. Wolf would love to see you. And Wilson Pharmacy, Dr. Love, the pill pusher with a smile, co pays are welcome. Hope you enjoyed those shameless plugs. That's the most we could do for you today. Let's thank Grassy Valley once again. And we're also going to use that applause as a welcome back to K-Mall. As soon as we have a little scripture reading here and a prayer, I've asked our friend Steve Everode, who's the executive director of the East Tennessee Children's Home with the with the interactive display for us to sign up for some things uh, or participate in today at his display to have our opening prayer. And then Kay, we'll have you come right to the pulpit and, and bring us, please, uh, your message. The scripture is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. Therefore, my brothers, by, uh, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fail, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's be encouraged as we continue to enjoy our time of fellowship at this rally uh, today. Steve. Pray with me. Our Father, we're just glad that we can call you Father this afternoon. It's certainly a privilege for us to to be able to speak with you in prayer. We don't have to, to be here this afternoon. We, we get to be. We realize uh, that our life and everything that we do for you is, is a privilege. We thank you so much for sending us uh, Kay. We appreciate her ministry in, in Cincinnati, and we pray uh, your richest blessings upon her and her husband as they continue to serve you there. Uh, bless her now as she comes to, to speak with us. May your will be done in our lives. Nothing more, nothing less, and, and nothing else. For we pray in Jesus' awesome name. Amen.
For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts with the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing greatness of the power may be from God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, in order that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, in order that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in us. So then death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore also we speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you for all things are for your sake, that the grace which is spreading to yet more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. And therefore, we do not lose heart. For though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day, while momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, while we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are unseen. For things which are seen are temporal, but things which are unseen are eternal." For we know that if this earthly tent, which is our home, is torn down, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Sometimes the scripture itself is so powerful that you hesitate to add anything to it. And I definitely feel that way about those wonderful words written by the Apostle Paul and recorded in the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians and the first verse of chapter 5. But having said that, I just want to say a few things this afternoon because I feel like this scripture addresses our topic that Christ is enough. He is enough to comfort us in our heartaches. And I think this section of scripture teaches us that in several ways. One of the things that I think it teaches us is that our heartaches are under God's control. Did you hear what Paul said? That we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing greatness of the power may be from God and not from us. Isn't that a a freeing thought? Our heartaches are not in our control. They are in his control. I don't mean to imply that I think God causes our heartaches, but I do mean that I think that God uses our heartaches. And I think that's what Paul is also saying in the 8th chapter of Romans when he said, And in all things God works together for good, in the lives of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. The reason that all things work together in our lives for good is because our God works in them to bring good from them. And he teaches us something about those heartaches that are under his control. One of those things is that he seeks to deepen our walk with him. I remember hearing Jill Briscoe speak several years ago And one of the things she told in that particular message was about a time when their little son, David, was at that point just six or seven years old. And they received a call from the school on Friday saying that David had fallen on the playground and hurt his arm. They thought it was okay, but they suggested that the Briscoes watch it throughout the weekend. And it seemed to them on Saturday that he was definitely favoring his arm and that it seemed to be bothering him. So Stuart Briscoe said to his young son, Now, David, on Monday, we're not going to send you to school, but we're going to take you to the hospital and they're going to x-ray you. 
Well, they didn't say any more about it, but it seemed to them that as the day went on and then on Sunday that he was more reserved and more quiet, and they felt like they'd made the right decision. So on Monday morning, they loaded him up in the car and they started off to the hospital. And Stuart Briscoe could see David in the rearview mirror in the back seat, just kind of huddled there, looking very white and scared. And he said to him, David, it's going to be all right. They're just going to x-ray you. And David said, it's all right, Dad. I know what it means to be executed. And they said... The, this poor little kid all weekend thought they were going to take him to the hospital where he would be executed. And Jill Briscoe said the wonder of it was he got in the car with them to go because he had that kind of confidence in his parents. And sometimes I think God wants us to have that kind of confidence in him that whatever happens to us is under his control. I have long loved something that Hudson Taylor, a pioneer missionary, said. He said that when we are going through circumstances in our lives that are difficult, we just need to make sure that those circumstances never get between us and God. Because he said, if they don't get between you, the only power they have is to push you closer to him. But when you allow the circumstances to come between you, then they pose a barrier between you and God. And I like to remember that in my life, to allow my circumstances to push me closer and to remember that my circumstances are under his control. And maybe through that circumstance, he is seeking to deepen my walk with him. A poet wrote these words, I am leading my child to a heavenly land. I am guiding her day by day. And I ask her now as I take her hand to come home by a rugged way. It is not a way she herself would choose. For its beauty she cannot see. But she knows not what her soul would lose if she didn't walk that path with me. Don't you think that's descriptive? If God were to ask us to choose the circumstances that we go through, I think we could come up with a pretty good list of circumstances that we would like in our lives. But God was wise to take the control out of the, of the circumstances out of our hands and keep them in his. Because he knows that it is only by going through those circumstances, it is only by walking rugged roads that we can be pushed back to him. But he wants us to know that no matter how rugged the road or how steep, that he is enough. And he's using it to deepen our walk. He's using it perhaps to deepen our faith. I read a book called The Faith Crisis by a man named Ron Dunn. And in that book, he said that the problem with most of us is not that we do not have enough faith to be healed. He said we probably all have enough faith to be healed. He said it's that we do not have enough faith to be sick if that be God's will. Because he said it is easier to escape than it is to endure. And it is easier to believe that God is when it seems as though he is than to believe that God is when it seems as though he is not. And in every person's life, at some time or another, there is going to come a time when it seems as though God is not. And by walking through those circumstances and believing that he is enough, even in those times, that's when our faith can be deepened. But I think that the Apostle Paul goes on to say, not only are our circumstances under God's control, that the surpassing greatness of the power may be from God and not from ourselves. He wants us to see that it is our very circumstances that give us the opportunity to be conformed to the image and the nature of Jesus Christ. Did you hear what Paul said in 2 Corinthians? He said, always caring about in my body the dying of Jesus in order that the life of Jesus may be seen in me. I don't know that I had ever noticed that before. Always caring about in my body the dying of Jesus. 
That doesn't sound like a very pain-free process, does it, to carry about in our body the dying of Jesus? Nofel Staten said in his commentary on 2 Corinthians that Jesus did not just go to a cross at the end of his three-year ministry, but he lived on a cross every day of that ministry. And the things that you see happening there on the cross that was the reality of what Jesus had lived out in those three years before that. On the cross, he refused to play power games, but he had refused to play power games before that. On the cross, he was looking out for the needs of others, but that's what he had done in the midst of his life. Everything that happened then had already happened in his life and in his ministry. And sometimes when things happen to us, I think we... We cry out and we want God to take away his hand. We want him to make it better. And sometimes God allows us to go through those things because he wants us, he wants something for us more than just being better. He wants us to be conformed to the image and the nature of Jesus. I remember a preacher saying once that he was holding a revival in another state from where he lived. And one afternoon, he didn't have anything that he was supposed to be doing, so he went to a shopping center. And towards the end of the afternoon, he came back to the house where he was staying, and his hostess said to him, they called from the church, and they said they have a message for you, and they want you to come there and get the message. And he said, well, couldn't I just call them and have them tell me over the phone? And she said, no, they said that you needed to come. And so he said, all the way to the church, I kept thinking, which one? Which one of my family, my wife, my children, who is it? Because he felt like if the message was that serious, it must be threatening someone that he loved. And when he got there, he found out that one of his daughters had been tragically killed. And then he went on to say in that message, that one of the first things that came into his mind at that time were some words that he had heard spoken by a Romanian preacher who said he had been persecuted and imprisoned and released and people were coming to him and saying it's just terrible that you've had to go through all that you've gone through. And the Romanian pastor said, you know, it's difficult to be comfortable when you're hanging on a cross. It's difficult to be comfortable when you're hanging on a cross. And did not Jesus say, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. For whosoever will save his life will lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same will find it. And sometimes I think we forget that we started out our Christian lives to take up our cross daily and to follow him. And it is in that taking up of our cross that we have the opportunity to be conformed to the image and the nature of Jesus. A missionary in the Congo said that she just felt like she wasn't communicating with the people she was trying to reach. And so she went to some of the national preachers and she said, can you tell me what's wrong, why I can't seem to get through? And he said very kindly, but he still said, you know, sometimes we see so much you that we see very little Jesus. And then he told her that if you were to take the capital letter I and bend it at both ends, you could form a C. And that when the I in us is bent, then Christ can be formed. Now, please don't misunderstand, because I do understand that it's not a pain-free process, this taking up our cross daily and following him. I do understand that it is a lifelong process. It's not something you ever retire from. But I also believe that when we find it difficult to be conformed, to the image and the nature of Jesus, then we find that he is enough to give us the strength to do what he's called us to do. I think he would also have us to understand that whatever it is we're going through, it's only temporary. 
Don't you love those words that this momentary light affliction, it's producing for us an eternal weight of glory. When you're going through an affliction, does it necessarily seem light? Does it necessarily seem momentary? What if the affliction goes on? What if it's something you have to deal with for five years or 10 years or 20 years? Is he not saying that in the light of eternity, whatever we go through now is just momentary? It's just a light affliction, but it produces for us an eternal weight of glory. But he wants us to understand that if it does last, five years or 10 years or 20 years or whatever it is, he is enough to give us the strength that we need to bear whatever it is that we have to bear. Not too long ago, I was reading something by Jennifer Rothschild, who lost her vision when she was just about 17 years old. And she said she was speaking somewhere and someone came up to tell her about her husband who had been shot when he was young and the bullet had, had injured his spine and he had been paralyzed for much of his life. And she said people are always saying to him, when you get to heaven, what's the first thing you'll do? Will you want to walk? Will you want to run? What will you do? And she said, he always says, the first thing I will do is kneel at the throne of Jesus and cast my crown before him. Don't you think that's what we'll do with all of those things that have seemed so pressing to us now? When we're standing there, I don't think they're going to matter that much. And when they are present, then he is still enough. I read of some Chinese Christians who were persecuted because of their faith. They were told in front of their village that if they did not deny their faith in this Jesus, they would be put to death, and they refused to deny their faith. Their children were taken out of their arms, and they were told that if they didn't deny their faith, then their children would be executed in front of them. And they reached out towards their children and they said, we'll see you soon. And then their children were hanged in front of them. And then they were given one last chance to deny their faith in Jesus. And they again refused. And they were forced to lie down in a row. And a steamroller came in. And they were told that if they didn't deny their faith, that that steamroller would run right over all of them. And they reached out and they grabbed the hand of the person who was next to them and they sang, Nearer, my God, to thee, nearer to thee. Isn't that the reality of what we live? That he is enough for whatever he asks us to go through. Now, we may never have to go through something like that, but there is something in all of our lives that at times just threatens to come between us and him. And we have to push it away and remember that it's only temporary. It's only power is to conform us to the image and the nature of Jesus Christ. And then finally, the last thing that I want to say is that I think he wants us to understand that we don't have to understand. Have you ever known anyone who said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God about this? Or when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God about that? Now, I don't know what it's going to be like, but when I think of people from every tongue and tribe and nation gathered around the throne of God and of the Lamb crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is. I just can't see us piping up and saying, Now in July of 1985, I just didn't understand the plan. Don't you think at that time it's not going to matter? that we understand it's only going to matter that we believe that he was enough and we stand before him. 
And I want you to know that your, your understanding does not, does not control whether God works or not. I've always been glad that God's working does not depend upon my understanding because there are things that even at the end of my life, I still don't understand why they happened when they happened, but it doesn't mean that God hasn't worked and that he hasn't been enough. Have you heard the story of David and Svi Flood, who in 1921 went to be missionaries in the Congo? They took with them their little son, and they had this vision that they and another couple were going to a village that had never been reached with the gospel, and they were going to live there, and they were going to share the gospel, and the village would be converted, and it would be a wonderful thing. But it didn't play out exactly the way they envisioned it. They did go to a village that had never heard the gospel along with another couple, but the people in the village didn't really want them there. And in fact, the chief wouldn't allow them to come in to that village. And so they could just build their little mud huts some distance away from the village. The only contact they were allowed to have with the village was with a young school-age boy who was allowed to bring them some food once a week. David and Svi Flood and the other couple became very discouraged, but then Svi Flood decided that if this little boy was the only one she ever had the opportunity to talk to, she was going to share Christ with him. The other couple got discouraged after they had all battled sickness and left, and David and Svi Flood stayed and still worked with that little boy. And then Svi became pregnant, had a difficult pregnancy, but the chief of the village would not allow anyone to come and help her. Finally, she gave birth to a little girl whom they named Anna, and she died, Svi died just a few days later. David Flood became very bitter and disillusioned. He buried his wife. He put a, a crude white cross on her grave, he carved her name into that cross, and then he took his son and his daughter back to the mission station. He put his, his tiny little baby in the arms of the other missionary couple and said, here, you take care of her, I can't. And he took his son and he went back to Sweden, a bitter, disillusioned man. The couple that he'd given Anna to got sick a few months later and they died and she was passed off to yet another missionary couple who brought her back to the United States, raised her to know and love the Lord. Eventually she went to Bible college, married a preacher, went to Seattle, and eventually he became the president of a Bible college in that area. Her adoptive parents had been careful to tell her the story of her father and her mother and their sacrifice in the Congo. And one day into her mailbox came a, a magazine that was in Swedish. She thought that was so unusual because she knew her family was from Sweden, but she read no Swedish. But out of curiosity, she was just thumbing through the magazine and she encountered an article that was obviously from Africa because of the pictures that she could see. And then as she turned a page, she saw a little grave and a white cross. And she could see the words, Svi Flood, on that cross. She jumped in her car, took the magazine, went to the college where her husband was president because she knew there were some people who spoke Swedish, and she took took the magazine to one of the professors and said, what does it say? What does it say? And he read it and he said, it tells the story of a little boy who was led to the Lord by a missionary couple that was there for not very long before the woman became ill and died. But it goes on to tell how that little boy went away to college, became a teacher, came back, and led his whole school to Christ. And the students brought their parents, and their parents became believers. And the chief of that village who had been so resistant also gave his life to Christ. Anna said she just couldn't stop the tears. Here were her mom and dad who'd made that sacrifice. Here was her father thinking that his whole life had been a waste and that God had failed him. And God was working 
all the time, even though he didn't understand. For their 25th wedding anniversary, the faculty of the college gave them a trip to Sweden, and she had one goal in mind, to try and find her father. And she did, and she found out that he had married again and that he had four other children. But when she found them, she found out that her dad was in very poor health, and the siblings said, well, we want you to see him, but you have to know that he's a very angry man. And whatever you do, don't mention the name of God because it throws him into a rage. She went into the room where her dad was in bed and she said, Papa, it's Anna. And he turned and looked at her and he said, Oh, Anna, I never meant to give you away. And she said, It's all right, Papa. God worked it for good. And he said, Don't say that name to me because he took everything from me. And she said, no, Papa, no. And she told him the story of the boy who won his students, who won their parents, who brought the chief, and how at a time when he felt so abandoned by God that God was working in a way that he could never even have dreamed possible. Some years after that, Anna and her husband went to a conference in England with Christians from all over the world. And she said people were popping up from all over the, the world and giving testimonies about what God was doing in their countries. And she said there was a man there from the Congo, and he stood up and he told about thousands of Christians in his country. And she said afterwards, I knew I shouldn't go talk to him, but she said I couldn't stop myself from going over and she said, I know you will never have heard of them, but my mom and dad were missionaries in the Congo and she told him their names. And he said, I am that little boy that your mother and father won to Christ. Isn't that incredible? When someone would think that nothing good could come of it, when someone would think I could never understand how God could work in that circumstance, that God's working does not depend upon our understanding. And even when we don't understand and our circumstances seem bleak, that he is still at work and he is enough. I want to leave you this afternoon with a look at the Lord Jesus Christ. This is something I share often in places where I speak, and I do it without apology because I feel like if we just have burn on our hearts and minds an image of who Jesus is, then surely we will not lose sight of the fact that no matter what we're going through, he is enough. These words were written by an African-American preacher, and this is what he said about our Jesus. Jesus Christ, the irresistible, is the king. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And he's my king. Do you know him, the irresistible Jesus Christ? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure could ever define his limitless love. No far-reaching telescope could ever bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supplies. No barrier could ever hinder him from pouring out his blessing. And he's my king. Do you know him, the irresistible Jesus Christ? Well, he's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperatively powerful. He's impartially merciful. And he's my king. Do you know him, this irresistible Jesus Christ? Well, he's the greatest phenomenon ever to cross the horizon of the world. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He stands in the solitude of himself. He's august and he's unique. He's unparalleled and he's unprecedented. He's the loftiest ideal in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. 
philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the necessity of spiritual religion. He's the miracle of the ages. He's the superlative of every good thing you should ever choose to call him, and he's the only one qualified to judge men's motives, and he's my king. Do you know him, this irresistible Jesus Christ? Well, he's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a gateway to knowledge. He's a doorway to deliverance. He's a pathway to peace. He's a roadway to righteousness. He's my king, the irresistible Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Well, he's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overcomer of the overcomers. He's the governor of the governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And he's my king. Do you know him, this irresistible Jesus Christ? Well, he's available to the tempted and tried. He supplies strength to the weak. He saves and he sympathizes. He guards and he guides. He healed the sick. He cleansed the lepers. He forgave sinners and he discharged debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the unfortunate. He serves the aged. He regards the meek and he beautifies the weak. And he's my king. Do you know him, this irresistible Jesus Christ? Well, his office is manifold, his promise is sure, his life is matchless, his goodness is limitless, his mercy is everlasting, his reign is righteous, his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. And he's my king, the irresistible Jesus Christ. And then the preacher went on to say, I wish I could describe him to you. I really do. But he said, listen, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. The heaven of heavens can't contain him, let alone a mere man try to explain him. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault with him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't hold him, and the grave couldn't handle him. And he's my king, the irresistible Jesus Christ. Well, listen, he has always been and he always will be. There was nobody before him and there will be nobody after him. He had no predecessor and he had no successor. You can't impeach him and he's not going to resign. Praise God. That's our king, the irresistible Jesus Christ. Praise God. That's our king, the irresistible Jesus. And he is indeed enough. Let's pray. Dear Father, with humble hearts, we thank you for the irresistible Jesus Christ. We thank you that he was willing to leave heaven and to tabernacle among men to make a way for us to come back to you. And Father, we pray that as the circumstances of our lives press upon us, that they will press us ever closer to you and to him so that we can be conformed to the image and nature of that irresistible Jesus. We love him, we love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Would you please stand as we dismiss for today? Thank you so much for making this event wonderful for us. Thank you for your awesome word and encouragement, Kay. We appreciate it. I'll tell you what, I cannot compete with a prayer like that. My heart is, mi is mixed with yours in that last word of praise that you gave and commitment and humility that was expressed in that conclusion of prayer. So we're not going to pretend to do another prayer as part of a ceremony today. We will let that be our message before God to ask for his presence with each of us as we depart today. Amen? Amen. Amen. We prayed that with you. Friends, next year, October 14th, 2010. Guest speaker, Bob Shannon. Location, to be announced. God bless you. Be safe as you travel.